All right, hello everybody. Welcome back to Discovery Day Online, The Mighty Dinosaurs. I am Gabriel Santos, Collections Manager and Outreach Coordinator for the ALF Museum of Paleontology. And I am very, very excited to introduce all of you today to our second speaker, Dr. Nathan Smith. Hi, Dr. Smith. Welcome to Discovery Day Online. We're really happy to have you here today. Hey, Gabe. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's great to be uh, doing some programming with the ALF again. <laughs> I'm really excited. We're going to talk a little bit about Antarctic dinosaurs today. This is something that's really, really interesting to me. Uh, and I know it's going to be super interesting to a lot of our folks um, online. So before we get started, let me introduce you all to uh, Dr. Nathan Smith. Dr. Nathan Smith is the Associate Curator of the Dinosaur Institute at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, which is actually my home museum. I used to go there all the time as a kid. Uh, his research focuses on the origins and early evolution of dinosaurs, and his fieldwork has taken him to Antarctica, Argentina, China, and throughout the western USA. Nate's Antarctic research is supported by the National Science Foundation and is featured in the Traveling Museum exhibition Antarctic Dinosaurs and the large format film Dinosaurs of Antarctica. You've been to a lot of really cool places. <laughs> Yeah, I've been really fortunate to have a lot of great opportunities for field work over my career. And it's it's still definitely the, the best part of the gig. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't get to do field work very often, but when I do get to go, it's it's really fun. Like just being out there and then like, you know, the chance to find something that nobody has seen in millions of years when you hit the rock in the right place. It's just one of those really cool, those cool opportunities, you know. <laughs> Yeah, paleontology is still very much a, a discovery-driven science, and I think that's one of the things that attracts a lot of us to it. Oh, yeah. And speaking of discovery, today you're going to take us to the South Pole, pretty much, right? In uh, the really, really cool world of Antarctica. I think this is going to be really exciting for a lot of folks, because I think the only uh ex exposure to paleontology and uh, antarctica for a lot of folks is the thing and we all know that didn't turn out very well so i'm hoping your story is a lot less terrifying than that movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah things things worked out a little bit better for us you know it, it helps when you're studying you know things that are that are long dead <laughs> <laughs> no frozen aliens in this story which is really cool all right, so everybody, uh, well, what's gonna happen is Dr. Smith will give his presentation and afterward we'll have time for a Q&A. So if you have any questions about Antarctic dinosaurs or excavating in Antarctica, you can put your questions in the chat and we'll be sure to ask them um, after the presentation. All right, Dr. Smith, you are ready to go. Okay, let me switch this over and pull up that first and Gabe, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you see everything okay on your end? Does that look good, guys? Yep, looks great. Okay, just want to double check. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll start. So um, I want to talk to you guys today a little bit, um, kind of give you a narrative of what it's like to, to go to Antarctica and collect fossils there, um, and a little bit of the, the reasons why um, we're doing paleontology down there. So a lot of times when I, when I give public talks and you know, mention the, the idea or mention Antarctic dinosaurs, um, this is kind of the picture that, that pops up in people's heads, something like this, right? Uh, and that's because we're kind of focused on what our world looks like today. You know, and our modern world is a pretty weird one, right? We've got the continents as far apart as they've ever been. We've got two polar ice caps, right? And one of the areas that I'm going to be talking about today um, near the Beardmore Glacier, where our dinosaurs in Antarctica are from, um, it's pretty far south. It's not quite at the South Pole, but about 85 degrees south latitude. But if we roll the ticker back to the early Jurassic, when these animals were actually living in Antarctica, right, that world is very different. The continents are still all um, connected, especially the southern continents. And we have no polar ice caps, right? This part of Antarctica that we're talking about for the dinosaurs is actually quite a bit further north. Um, and we would have had uh, quite a different climate during this time 190 million years ago, right? So a real, really different world that Antarctic animals were living in. And in some ways, a lot of these Antarctic animals were um, key 
in understanding what this world might have looked like hundreds of millions of years ago. Uh, and if we look at our modern world again, and we think about biodiversity, right, how species are distributed, this is kind of a heat map for um, terrestrial vertebrate species diversity. So hotter areas are where we have more species. We have some really striking patterns, like um, a thing we call the, the latitudinal um, diversity gradient, right, where we have much more species concentrated towards the equator, and then we kind of tail off towards both the poles. So a big question we have in paleontology is, how did these patterns come to be? Were the same types of patterns um, existent in deep time, right? If we had a very different world where the continents were connected hundreds of millions of years ago, did we have different patterns of biodiversity distribution? Um, so we have to go to places like Antarctica to figure that out. Another thing we paleontologists are constantly interested in is kind of patterns of biodiversity through time, right? So here's kind of a classic um, paleontology graph. So on the x-axis there is time, you know, going from older on the left to more recent on the right. And on the y-axis is the, the number of genera. This is a marine um, biodiversity curve. And, and one of the things we paleontologists talk about are, a lot are these big five mass extinctions, right? So major drop-offs in the number of species and genera that are around during those times. And we often talk about the big five mass extinctions and other um, kind of major events in Earth history as though they, they are global patterns. We see them happening everywhere. Um, but we have to be really careful about uh, making those extrapolations uh, from just a few well-sampled regions. If we really want to address what's happening globally, we have to make sure we're sampling globally and not just kind of from, you know, North America or Europe where most of our paleontological collections come from. Now, fortunately for us in Antarctica, um, in the central Transantarctic Mountains, there's actually rocks that bound um, two of these major mass extinction events, right? We have rocks on either side of the N-Permian mass extinction and then rocks on either side of the N-Triassic mass extinction. Um, so Antarctica is a great place to potentially learn a little bit more about what's happening um, in terms of biodiversity change uh, during these major events at high latitudes. So I've been fortunate enough to be a part of three Antarctic expeditions, um, two to the Beardmore Glacier and one more recently to the Shacklin Glacier. These are funded by the National Science Foundations. Um, and one of the places that we kind of kick off our expeditions is in McMurdo Station, which you, know, you may have heard of before. This is kind of the main staging point for a lot of science expeditions, but also the place where a lot of science itself just happens in McMurdo. Um, and McMurdo will kind of dispel the, the idea of Antarctica being a, a cold and desolate um, and lonely place because in the summer, you know, there's a, as many as a thousand people um, living in McMurdo Station. And I, I often compare it, it feels sometimes like a, a cross between a, a small liberal arts college and a mining town, right? So, you know, lots of people packed into dorms and cafeterias, lots of nerdy folks, um, but a lot of things smell like diesel and BO as well. <laughs> And it's around here on the coast where we see a lot of Antarctic wildlife, right? The charismatic Antarctic wildlife like our emperor penguins, um, things like Weddell seals. This one I love showing off because this year we had um, the seal with a little seal pup. And over here, um, if we go to the coast, this is actually an example of a penguin rookery. So all those tiny little black and white dots there are hundreds, if not thousands, of, of little penguins popping around. These are the Adelis. Um, this is a group that got really interested in our, our tents in 2003 and wanted to pop around the corner to see what was going on. So really curious dinosaurs. Um, but of course, this is this is all near the coast. We're not doing our paleontology right there by the coast. We've got to go further into the interior of Antarctica, and we do that by hitching a ride on these big um, LC-130s with skids attached to them that are uh, basically modified so they can land on the ice. So here's kind of a, an inset of the central Trans-Antarctic Mountains. So this is a mountain range that cuts across Antarctica. Right? And we're actually going to two regions that I've highlighted here. One is near the Beardmore Glacier that I'm going to focus on where a lot of our dinosaurs are from. And the other one is near the Shackleton Glacier. So this is what these temporary camps look like. This was the last time we were in the Beardmore Glacier area in, in 2010 and 11. And you can see that big ice runway that's groomed in the background for landing those LC-130s. And then we've got 
basically all kinds of um, tents set up for a, a galley, science tents, communications and engineering tents. And then over there in the, the left-hand side is a, kind of the suburbs where we all live in our little personal tents. And this is a similar setup that we had at the Shaklu Glacier in 2017, although a little bit smaller camp. The last Beardmore camp, I think we topped out at around 72, 75 people. This camp, we might have had as many as 40 at one time, uh, and maybe around seven different science teams supported. And the other thing to keep in mind when you're working in Antarctica is that you're there during our winter, but the austral summer, right? So it's light 24-7. Um, and you've got to get a little creative with, um, you know, some of your holiday celebrations since there, there aren't any Christmas tree farms uh, to work from in Antarctica. Um, and we do, we do camp on the ice. So we're on a little uh, neve that's not directly on the Beardmore Glacier, but nearby. Um, but one misconception is that we're not actually uh, digging through the ice or anything like that to find fossils. We're doing our paleontology just like we do it anywhere else. We've got to go to where the rocks are actually exposed at the surface. And for the dinosaurs, that means Mount Kirkpatrick in the background here. This is uh, the highest peak in the central Trans-Antarctic Mountains. We don't have to go all the way to the top of it, but we've got to get pretty close at about 12 and a half thousand feet. And it was here back in 1990 that this discovery was initially made, um, as often happens in paleontology, uh, through a little bit of serendipity. David Elliott, who is a geologist at Ohio State University, was working up section in the, through the rocks in, on Mount Kirkpatrick. He was actually more interested in the volcanic rocks towards the top of the mountain that kind of record the breakup of Gondwana and the separation of Antarctica from the other southern continents. But, you know, he was stopping for, for a little break, for a little lunch, and saw this in the side of the, the cliff, basically a, a huge femur leg bone of what was to become Cryolovosaurus weathering out. And for you paleontology bums out there that have a really keen eye for spotting fossils, you can probably look just below that leg bone and see some other darker gray bones that are kind of coming out in cross section. And that, that darker gray bone that's coming out in cross section ended up being the skull of Cryolovosaurus elliotti, so one of our um, most well-known dinosaurs now from Antarctica that gets its name, frozen crested lizard, from that big crest coming up off the, the top of the skull right there. And we've got a few pieces of the jaws as well, but you can see most of the, the toothy parts of this skull had already weathered out of the, the side of the rock before we got to it. So this is a, a reconstruction about what the rest of the skull would have looked like, as well as a life restoration of Cryolovosaurus. And working down there is, is really tricky. It's actually kind of a, a double-edged sword for us as paleontologists. We can't use a lot of traditional plasters and glues because um, it can sometimes be too cold at the altitude and temperature we're working at. Um, and the rock that the, this dinosaur is in is really heavily silicified. It's almost like concrete. Now, the good news is that means the bones and everything in it are not going to kind of crumble apart as we excavate them. But the, the rough news is it means we need to bring a lot of heavy equipment to actually quarry out big fossiliferous blocks. And I can tell you when it's, you know, 10 or 20 degrees below Fahrenheit and you're at 12 and a half thousand feet, you don't want to be hauling that jackhammer around. That'll make you feel out of shape really quick. <laughs> now, time is an issue for us working in Antarctica as well. We need to get um, as much fossil uh, layer removed as possible in, it, in as short a time as possible because the season isn't very long. Now, when we do a lot of paleontology, you know, out west, other places where we traditionally work, we have season after season to come back and, you know, maybe work with picks and shovels or even bring in a backhoe to kind of take off that overburden, that rock that is kind of in the way of our, our fossil layer. But in 2003, we actually got special permission um, to bring in Marty here. And Marty is an, uh, is an explosives expert. So Marty gets to bring in dynamite and then we get to make a, a little bit of a quicker go removing that top layer. <laughs> yeah, you can hear my, my colleague Bill Hammer um, maybe using some uh, some colorful language. <laughs> Not, now we didn't we didn't damage any fossils during this blast. We ourselves, as scientists, probably should have been a little bit further up the hill, um, as you saw in that video. 
but that that was great because it removed all this extra rock kind of on top of our fossil layer. So here's us in 2010, you know, coming back the, the next time around in much, much happier spirits because we were able to collect a lot more material that field season with, uh, with all that extra rock removed. In fact, we, we got so many blocks out of that cryolophosaurus quarry that we had a little bit of time at the end of the field season to actually go prospecting and looking for more finds. And sure enough, you know, where the, the cryolophosaurus quarry is is just over to the left of this image. And in the foreground there, um, you can see my colleague Peter Braddock was working on a partial new dinosaur skeleton that we found really nearby. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, another colleague, Roger Smith, started hollering at everybody just under that sandstone ledge um, when he was kind of um, looking at the rocks and kind of measuring contacts between them. He saw this coming out, these little bits of orange bone right here. And the ones I'm going to highlight are actually neural arches, so kind of the tops of our vertebrae in cross-section. Really, really exciting. Uh, another common paleontology problem, too, is that you, you, know, you find something new and cool and exciting right at the end of the season, so you have very little time to get it out. Um, we, we did extract about a half dozen blocks um, with this, this new dinosaur material, and this is an example of what one of them looked like when it was still partially prepped. So you can see it's just chock full of bone, right? We have some vertebrae, Highlighted here in magenta, we've got, uh, here are some of the ribs in blue. Here's one of the hind limbs highlighted in green. Right? And as we studied this more, what we realized is that we've got a new species of sauropodomorph, one of these early long neck dinosaurs, similar to animals like Massaspondylus from South Africa. And we didn't know it at the time in the field, but really exciting when we got back in the lab and started preparing some more of these blocks because one of them that didn't have anything on the surface underneath the rock had this gorgeous, gorgeous skull of this dinosaur. And you can see by the scale bar there, this isn't actually that large. Um, this, this dinosaur, this animal was probably only about four or five years old. So one uh, final kind of part about the, the process of doing paleontology in Antarctica is, okay, we've, we've quarried our blocks, we've got these blocks out of the rock, how do we get them back? Right? This is kind of a fun part too, you know, because it's it's not the same as when we do field work out west and we just throw these in the back of a pickup truck. And so we've got to kind of catalog, wrap everything, get it in that cargo net, and then get a little creative bringing it back to camp. actually my colleague Peter Braddock um, uh, hooking that up. He's a, a mountaineer from New Zealand that works with our team, you know, to kind of keep everybody safe uh, and perform these tasks because they, they don't pay me enough to stand under that helicopter. All right, but that's, that's getting all the stuff back. Um, and then, you know, what is one of the things that happens next? Well, in addition to the research, you know, and I'm not going to go into that in too much detail, I will say one of the funnest parts of my job um, is getting to share all these discoveries with, with, the, with the public. And we can do that in a number of ways, right? You know, we can do it like we're doing right now, which is having a, a seminar or presentation. But uh, also, in, in rare cases, we get to put together these amazing traveling exhibits like Antarctic Dinosaurs that I did with my um, colleague Pete McAvicky at the Field Museum. Um, and some of you might have had the chance to see this when it was uh, out here in Los Angeles last year. Um, it is just finishing up a run in Salt Lake City at their Natural History Museum uh, and is then on to Atlanta next. Um, it was really a lot of fun um, to work on this exhibit and kind of bring these animals and environments to life. And, you know, one of my favorite parts is not just these kind of flashed out reconstructions that we did, but these beautiful, beautiful um, kind of Antarctic winter night murals 
um, that, that uh, were commissioned and done as part of this exhibit, um, both for Crylophosaurus and for our Sauropodomorphs. Just really, really um, beautiful and immersive artwork. Um, one of the other fun things that I've been a part of uh, is working on a large format film uh, called Dinosaurs of Antarctica. This is done by Giant Screen Films in collaboration with the National Science Foundation. Um, and it just started debuting <laughs> when the pandemic hit last spring. So we had, we opened it in a few theaters and then kind of promptly had to shut down. Um, but we're doing a lot of educational programming um, and, and partner with these folks right now around the film um, and actually getting set to open it as theaters are slowly reopening. In fact, we're going to be um, showing this film in our uh, modified theater at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County once we reopen that space. Um, and so it was a lot of fun working on this, uh, working with the you know, CGI team on these animal models, and again, bringing, bringing the science um, and these animals back to life in a really uh, interesting and immersive way. And in conjunction with that, I even got um, to work with um, an artist and writer, Greg Neary, uh, on this uh, little educational graphic novella, uh, The Time-Traveling Dino Detectives of Antarctica, was kind of, which was kind of done as a little educational companion piece um, to the film, which is another, another fun way uh, you know, to, to get people interested and excited about Antarctic research and paleontology um, and use, you know, in some ways, use the dinosaurs as kind of a gateway um, to understanding more about Earth history and, and paleontology and, and evolutionary biology. So lots, lots of fun, lots of kind of creative ways um, that we can get our message out about Antarctic science and research. And so with that, I'm going to kind of switch us back here and thank you all for your time um, listening to this presentation. And as David said earlier, I think we're going to have a chance now uh, for a little discussion and Q&A. All right. Yeah, that yeah. was so cool. I am so envious of that awesome work and the awesome educational work you get to do. It's just like, it's like, a, it seems like this perfect package that you get to share all these amazing stories with the world. Yeah, being at the museum, I think that, that was one of the draws of it in a lot of ways as well. So I, I've been a, a professor in the biology department at Howard University in DC before I came here. And it's, I still love teaching and I still love working with students, but in a selfish way, when you work at a museum, like you, you get a little bit more of like an immediate feedback and, and payoff in terms of, you know, the educational outreach work that you're doing, because you can, you can see it in the kids' faces. You can see people get excited when they're coming through and experiencing the exhibits and that, you know, as opposed to sometimes, you know, with it with a student, you know, what you're, what you're putting in, sometimes you're, you're hoping that's going to pay off for them for their future career, you know, years, years down the line. <laughs> so yeah, selfishly, it's sometimes a little bit more of an, an, an immediate payback. <laughs> oh, I feel that for sure. Like, you know, when you're telling these cool things to a kid and like, they just smile, their face lights up because they learn something new is probably one of the best feelings in the world for me. So I totally understand how that works. Um, okay, let's see. We've got a lot of really cool questions from our audience. Um, before we get, I actually have a really quick question. So for working in Antarctica, I'm sure it's a lot different than preparing for field work here somewhere like in the Badlands or in Utah. How much prep time, I would say, goes into planning going to Antarctica, the frozen continent on the planet Earth? Yeah, so... The, the answer is years and years. Um, you know, we, these camps, these deep field camps might happen every seven years or so. And, you know, we're constantly planning, you know, as soon as we're done with one, we're bringing people in the community together to talk about research priorities, where we might go next. We hold conferences and workshops, um, kind of game planning, what, where future sites might be and what types of research they could support, who wants to go where and, and why. We're sending in white papers and research reports to the National Science Foundation to try and put pressure you know, on them to allocate resources for a camp. You know, and then, so that goes, that'll, that'll go on for a while. And then if the decision gets made to put in a camp, you know, then there's a call for proposals and that's a more traditional NSF route where then we've got to put in kind of a collaborative and competitive research proposal to get funded to take part in that camp. 
And then kind of the more nitty gritty logistics planning, you know, the, the camp is getting built um, with contractors through NSF, through the United States Antarctic Program. We, the researchers then have to, you know, in addition to kind of our, our research plan, put in a, a whole other thing we call the SIP, which is a big, you know, 80 page or so pack or outlining, okay, I think I need this much helicopter time. I think I need, you know, this much snowmobile time or and this much fuel for the places I'm going. This is the equipment that I'm going to need. You know, so a lot of the the kind of the the non research specific equipment, you know, we're getting we're getting kind of on loan through the U.S. Antarctic program, and we have to kind of allocate and set that up. Especially, we also bring a lot of our own tools as well. Like so, the paleontologists were bringing you know, sledgehammers and chisels and picks and also, you know, rock saws and jackhammers and generators. And so that also has to be organized, um, you know, and so what I do is I, I put a bunch of that stuff together and I really, this last time around, had about two pallets um, with about six different crates, you know, holding several thousand pounds that I've got to identify everything, label everything, put it together in a sheet, crate it up, ship it to Port Huynamay, which is, you know, just up the coast near Ventura from us. Right at the coast. And there, that stuff, that gets shipped out down to Antarctica so that it's there when we arrive. We'll go uh, fly to New Zealand and then fly down to McMurdo Station. And so actually that's one of the more hairy, like, um, you know, ner nerve wracking parts for me as, as the scientist, because I have to have all my tools and stuff ship down there, you know, in April, <laughs> and, and then I'm going to get down there in November. And so I really got to plan and make sure that anything, anything I need, I've got it ready to go. And I had it, I had it in one of those crates go, getting on the boat in April. <laughs> Ooh, that's a, that's gotta be a long period of anxiety. Just like hoping everything made it there in time. For sure. <laughs> uh, so getting there, what, like what's life like there? Like how is there like an acclimation period? Is there an adjustment time? Like for me, being from Southern California, I know, you know, like I'm not great with the cold, so <laughs> I feel like it'd be a huge change from like going from LA to Antarctica. It it can be, uh, and the weather can kind of change on a dime. Um, but when it's nice out there, if there's if there's not a lot of wind. And there's not a lot of cloud cover, so the sun's being down. You can feel really warm, and you can be walking around in the ice, you know, in, in jeans and a and a fleece, and feel pretty comfortable. I don't I don't ski, but a lot of people compare it to kind of skiing up in the mountains, you know, when the sun's really beating down, and you can um, you can feel that warmth. But yeah, if if the wind picks up and you get some cloud cover, temperature drops, and that wind will just bite right through you. Oof. Okay. Things to things to remember when you if you ever get to go to Antarctica. <laughs> All right, so here's some great questions we've got from our audience. This first one is from Jared McGowan and asking, from the species yet found and described, would you call them basal or stem members of known clades, or are they typically distinct enough to warrant classification as new lineages? Wow, that's a great question. Yeah, so te technically, you know, and any new species is a new lineage, right? Because it's kind of a new branch that we might be putting on um, the evolutionary or family tree. Um, these, these dinosaurs, these new ones that we have, have we think they belong to, you know, have relatives in that, what we might call kind of basal part of the sauropodomorph tree. So kind of the long neck dinosaurs before they become sauropods. So there's actually a, quite a bit of diversity of those types of animals all over the globe. What's interesting so far is that the Antarctic ones that we have, they seem to each have relatives in, in different parts of the world, right? So they're not, they're not all kind of closely related to each other. You know? And that seems to be a pretty common pattern that we're seeing during the early Mesozoic and dinosaur evolution, is that um, for whatever reason, it seems like these guys are, are spreading around the globe pretty easily. For uh, I think you talked about it for a little bit, but for those at home who might have missed it or not, how did dinosaurs end up in Antarctica? Right, so dinosaurs um, ended up in Antarctica just like they ended up ever, anywhere else, right? So dinosaurs evolved at some point. Um, the first ones we find are from the late Triassic, a little older than 225 million years. Um, and then they start diversifying pretty rapidly. 
You know, the first, the oldest ones we definitively have are from South America, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they got their start there. That's just where we have the first fossils right now. Um, what we do know is that it doesn't take them very long to distribute throughout the globe. Um, we don't have dinosaurs from the late Triassic of Antarctica yet. Um, that's, that's more so we don't have, we have some late Triassic rocks. They're, they're rocks that aren't super conducive to preserving fossils. And we also haven't had a chance to really search them thoroughly. So that's one of the things I'm very excited about is, is getting the chance to look in the, the late Triassic of Antarctica for more fossil vertebrates in the future. Awesome. Some new discoveries, maybe some new, uh, some new fossils in there. Hopefully no aliens again. We just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one is from King Cretaceous asking, were there any other large predators that would have competed with Cryolophosaurus for food, water, and space? Great question. So we, we don't know for sure in Antarctica. I mean, so far, the only um, theropod, the car carniv carnivorous meat-eating dinosaur that we have is Cryolophosaurus. And we have two specimens, at least, uh, of that animal right now. Um, we do know that's, that's one of the largest theropods that would have been running around during the early Jurassic. It's got relatives like Sinosaurus from China or Dilophosaurus, which you all know from, um, from Arizona, from here in the U.S. from the same time period, that are um, a little bit smaller. So as far as we can tell, Cryolophosaurus it, you know, is kind of the, the king of the early Jurassic during that time. But like, I, like I've em emphasized, I mean, we... We still are just scratching the surface of fossils and dinosaurs from places like Antarctica, right? We've only known about Cryolophosaurus and, and dinosaurs from the early Jurassic of Antarctica since 1990, and all of the stuff we have comes from that one spot on the side of Mount Kirkpatrick. So, you know, I'm I'm optimistic that there's a lot more waiting to be discovered. There's a huge like chapter of time just down there waiting to be uncovered, right? Let's see. Uh, this one is from Jared again. If you were to find more Cryolophosaurus specimens, how much variation in, say, crest morphology would we need to see before we consider a second species within the genus? Great question, yeah. So we, we often think about, you know, there are a lot of um, theropod dinosaurs that have really distinctive crests like Cryolophosaurus, and they all seem to kind of construct them and make them in a little bit different way. And we're not 100% sure what the function of some of these were. They're, they're, they're too thin or fragile for kind of like headbutting or any kind of combative purpose. Um, they don't seem to be, uh, you know, have a lot of uh, nerves or vessels in them or, or in many cases, in most cases, don't seem to be like heavily pneumatized or any thing. So there's a lot of some physiological things we can potentially rule out. Um, but we don't have a big enough sample size to, to ask questions like, hey, do the males and females show differences in crest morphology? Um, or is this kind of a, a species signaling thing you know, to, to, help, um, to help identify you know, uh, conspecifics? Um, so in reality, yeah, we need, you know, we, we'd need a sample size probably of a, a couple dozen at least to start really getting a handle on are there are, are any differences in those that crest morphology due to kind of differences between the genders, due to on, um, ontogenetic differences, right? Do the young ones have different shapes and sizes than the old ones? Or are they kind of um, uh, taxon taxonomic differences, right? Do different species have different types of crests? Yeah. So it can be when you only have such a small sample size. And I mentioned we have two of Cryolovasaurus, but we've only got the one skull with the crest. You know, so we've got just one right now so we can't say a whole lot about the diversity of what those crests would have looked like and their function so because you need more specimens like working in antarctica probably has its own set of challenges and things like that but does working with fossils that have been buried under ice does that have its own set of challenges for terms of like preservation and also keeping the fossils safe as you excavate them yeah, so so that is an important difference of collecting fossils in Antarctica. So we're not we're not actually digging through the ice. We're go, we're going to the, where the rocks are jutting out of the ice, just like just like we do paleontology anywhere else. But one big difference, and you could maybe see it in some of those pictures of the rock outcrop, is that a Antarctica is a desert, right? And it's a cold desert. It's not getting a lot of precipitation, and there's not a lot of running water in those places. So if you picture in your head, kind of our our classic paleontology field localities, you know, like the, the, 
the vast kind of sloping badlands and everything like that. You think about what that rock looks like at the surface. It's all kind of pebbly and it looks like popcorn, right, we sometimes say. It's because that water is getting in there, right, and clays are expanding and breaking apart the rock at the surface. And that's great for producing more fossils, right? That erosion is happening and, you know, bone is, is weathering out. And we can find those bits and pieces of bone and trace them back up to a site to try and excavate. In Antarctica, that's happening really, really slowly. Like you saw that picture of the Crylobosaurus femur, it wasn't all shattered and busted apart at the surface. It was a whole, you know, perfect looking femur weathering out. Um, because that rock isn't breaking apart, the rock at the surface in Antarctica is just as hard as everything underneath. Um, so that that actually makes it a little, little difficult. Um, um, it can make it more difficult to find fossils sometimes because you're finding them where they actually are, as opposed to Gabe, like you know, when you're out hunting for fossils, it's often a couple pieces of bone that you find first, and then you've got to trace it back up. Um, but the, the flip side is, it means that that stuff is really hard and really held together at the surface, and so, you know, we don't have to dump a whole bunch of glue on it and plaster it up really carefully. We can just cut out nice blocks and take that stuff back. Nice. I'm sure that must mean a little bit more of a headache for your preparators when working on Antarctic fossils, though. For sure. I mean, this stuff has taken years and years to prepare. And there's still, there's still material of Crylobosaurus and these new dinosaurs that is being actively prepared right now. I mean, and, and that is kind of one of the, the important chains in um, field paleontology is that for, for every hour we might spend excavating or collecting something in the field, it might mean 400 or 500 hours of preparing it back in the lab. Oh, yeah. Shout out to all the preparators out there. They're the ones who do like a lot of, pa they have a lot of patience. Let's see this question. Oh, this question's from Evan Johnson Ransom, who is actually a good friend of ours at the Alpha Museum and another paleontologist. Evan is asking, um, what's the status of Crylophosaurus and its phylogenetic placement? Is it still a basal, oh boy, uh, titan titanoran theropod? That was awful, but yeah. No, you're good. Hey, and hey, Evan, it's good to, good to see you. Well, not to see you, but to have you on the, the Skype here. Um, yeah, so there's there's still some controversy about where Crylophosaurus fits in the family tree of dinosaurs. When it was initially described, right, it was described as a close relative of Allosaurus. Um, then some studies by myself and colleagues like Matt Carano kind of pulled it down the dinosaur tree a little bit as kind of one of the most basal members of a group called Tetanurin or Tetanurae. Um, so, you know, which is, this is, it makes it kind of an early member, a very, very old member of that group. Um, but a lot of the work that, that I've done since then, and as we've excavated and found more material of Crylobosaurus, does suggest that it might be more closely allied with other early Jurassic theropods like Dilophosaurus. Um, you know, we're still um, working up some of that material to publish some of the new stuff that we collected in, in 2010, um, but I think that's how it's going to shake out right now. Um, but it's not a simple kind of cut and dry story. There are parts of the anatomy of uh, Cryolophosaurus that definitely look more tetanurin um, than what you see in an animal like Coelophysis or Dilophosaurus, but there's there's also some interesting traits that we see only in Crylobosaurus and Dilophosaurus that might hint at them being related. Cool. Hope that helped, Evan. And it's Tetanuran. So Tetanurae is the name of the group, and and a member of that group would be a Tetanuran. Tetanuran. Okay, I've got that. I've got unlocked now. <laughs> uh, here's a really quick question. Uh, will the uh, well, the film uh, Antarctica of Dinosaurs of Antarctica, will that be on DVD or released for future viewing or streaming one day? Ooh, good question. Um, and I even had this brought up with uh, the producers um, a week or so ago, and we don't, we don't know yet. Um, you know, they're still, they're, they're still doing their plan to kind of roll it out in different theaters. Um, I think it's going to be at the Science Museum in Minnesota soon. We, when we reopen our theater, it'll be here. Um, it has opened and been at other places, um, you know, uh, Mods in Fort Lauderdale. Um, in the past, that group, they have had some of their um, films go on to streaming services before. I think that all gets kind of negotiated after 
the theater run and whatnot and, and done them as DVDs as well. Um, we, we were in, uh, our Ghost Ranch project was featured in an older one they did called Dinosaurs Alive. And I know that that one for a little bit of time was, um, was on Netflix. So you can catch it there. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get, you know, a, a couple of different format options for it, that we can get the DVD if we want, or that, you know, a streaming service would probably be the, the way for it to get its biggest footprint. But, but I'm not the guy that gets to negotiate <laughs> those things. <laughs> Well, in the meantime, if you're, you know, if things are getting safer and you can come out to LA, there's a great place for you to check it out. Also, I have to say that Antarctic Dinosaurs exhibit is so good. I got to see it twice. I saw it at the Field Museum and then when it finally came over to LA. And every time I just had such a great time. It, like the way that you you all combine like the the replicas and the art and just even the lighting and even the like the graphic design on it, it's just such a good exhibit. So props to all of you who designed that thing. Yeah, big shout out to the whole the whole team on that. That was I was really fortunate uh, to be involved in that um, in that project. And I, I feel like you know even as someone that you know got to collect a lot of the material and study and work on a lot of the material, like it, that was. What made that exhibit so great is just like you said, like all of the different angles of exhibit design um, and interactive coming together. And it, and it truly felt like an unimmersive um, um, exhibit. How, how closely do paleontologists often get to work on exhibits like that? Like, do you work like in the whole entire planning processes or do you kind of just come in for the science portion? It can, it can run the gamut and I've kind of, done a, a couple of different models of that there are some like if we're taking a traveling exhibit from a different group like from the american museum you know we'll still have an in-house curator like assigned to that like i did one of my first ones was when we showcased um the pterosaur exhibit flight in the age of dinosaurs you know but we're kind of already getting everything set you know antarctic dinosaurs that was one that um myself and pete at the field like, were integral in, in designing and developing from you know the very beginning um, and so that was you know, a years long process and a ton and a ton of work. Um, but it was also really fantastic to do it because yeah, you, you know, you put your whole heart into it and you get to, you know, um, you know, have not the final say all the time, but at least a, a say and you know, how a lot of this stuff is depicted and what kind of stories you're telling with the exhibit. Which, which project made you more nervous getting stuff ready to send Antarctica or preparing to create a whole exhibit for people to see? <laughs> Ooh, I think, honestly, I think it was getting, you know, getting stuff ready for Antarctica. I always get more anxiety, you know, about the field season and things like that. And especially a place like Antarctica where it's like, you know, we spent, we, we would have, for the Shackleton trip, it's like we've spent seven years preparing for this, planning for this, you know, tons of money is being invested by the National Science Foundation, tons of time and, and us. And at the end of the day, you know, for us to be successful, we got to find stuff. <laughs> sure. And that's, that's not necessarily a foregone conclusion and you know when you work down there a lot too you realize that you, you're also at the mercy of kind of these you know logistics snafus and the weather like there's a lot of different ways a lot of things can go wrong that have nothing to do with how well you would have planned but that might prevent you from getting stuff done fortunately you know knock on wood in the 2017 field season we had incredible weather so like i know you're talking about being nervous about you know being too cold down there it was more often the case in 2017 that we felt too warm. Like we felt like we were in the banana belt sometimes. Wow. Um, in Antarctica. Were... Oh. I mean, still cold, you know, compared to Southern California, uh, but much, much more manageable than, than some of the weather you can get down there. Cool. I guess it's just like any other place. Sometimes you got to wear shorts weather. Sometimes you've got your jeans weather. <laughs> there you uh... go. <laughs> Here's a question from, oh, Bailey Jorgensen, who is from the ALF Museum. Uh, Bailey is asking, do you have a favorite moment or memory from your time in, uh, in Antarctica so far? Ooh, a single favorite moment or memory. That'd be tough. I have, I have a lot. Um, but I would say, you know, working in the, in the camps, in the remote camps, it, it, there's nothing quite like that and you meet the most amazing people down there like the you know it's because it's not just the scientists we have camp staff that are you know um kind of coordinating the the aircraft that are flying the aircraft that are 
coordinating communications and weather reporting, you know, that are um, doing the, the cooking work in the galley. And it's, it's the most incredible people um, that all have, like, they're, they're all Renaissance men and women kind of in their own rights and the different skills that they bring together. And it's, it's kind of like being in a, in, a, in a remote camp in Antarctica with, like, 12 MacGyvers that, like, everybody there, you know, you know you can put your, your trust in and, and you know is going to have your back and, and, and help you out and take care of you. So any any time we get to work in those in those camps, that's fantastic. And I, and the, the one thing that we do well is that we we work hard down there, but we also play hard. Um, and you know, uh, a common theme um, that happens in Antarctica, especially at remote camps, is you know, fun things like uh, you know, Christmas carol singing on the on the radios between research stations on on, on Christmas, but also. also um, you know, we'll do dance parties uh, for Christmas Eve and, and New Year's, um, and often, often there are people that that manage to sneak down some really interesting costumes <laughs> to some of those parties. Um, we've had volleyball games, and even uh, we organized a uh, a New Year's Day softball tournament <laughs> on the ice in the Shaflin Glacier. So. Um, those those are some of the best memories. I mean, obviously, the easy ones to pick are kind of the new discoveries and the finds in the field, but but those memories are pretty special for me as well. <laughs> That's awesome. It sounds like it's you know, you're down there, but it it it's like you're at the moment, an experience of a lifetime kind of thing. So people are just trying to enjoy as much as they can, right? For sure. I have uh, here's another question that I think Bailey might get mad if I don't ask penguins in antarctica did you see some and what was it like when you saw them yes uh, um you see them uh, mostly around the coast you know the the emperors the big ones and then the adeli penguins um the last two times i was down there we didn't see that money because we didn't have as much time um kind of out on the ice in the area around mcmurdo station and in 2003 a lot of those photos i showed you were actually we had the opportunity to do a little shakedown trip which is kind of um, like a, an overnighter that we do near McMurdo Station to basically test out all our gear, like our tents, our cooking stoves, stuff like that. Because you don't want to get that all the way out to the remote camp and find out there's a hole in your tent or something doesn't work right or you know something is broken. And for that shakedown trip, we got to kind of one of these pistols and, and drive around um, Ross Island, get to, get to go by some of these penguin rookeries, see them up close, uh, get to check out some of these old huts from Shackleton's expedition. So that was some of my best kind of wildlife and, uh, you know, early explorer Antarctica photos and, and, and stuff come from that 2003 season. And so that was, that was a real special one. That's so cool. Like you, you're excavating, you know, fossil dinosaurs and you get to go look at like living Antarctic dinosaurs. What a cool experience. I, I yeah, really hope to fun, see those one day. It's a fun part about Antarctica that we like to, to share with folks is that, okay, you know, we know the dinosaurs are down there, you know, in the Jurassic, then we kind of run out of rocks in the central trans-Antarctic mountains. But if you move to the um, Antarctic Peninsula, where we have kind of mid and late Cretaceous rocks, we know that we have dinosaurs living up until the end of the Mesozoic there, right? And then we know that our, our non avian go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, but we get penguin fossils in Antarctica pretty early as well. And so um, extinction it doesn't take dinosaurs very long to recolonize Antarctica. Oh, cool. I didn't know that actually. Fossil penguins that early on. That's awesome. Another thing for me to add to my wiki uh, expedition later after today, I always learn so many new things from our like these uh, virtual sessions that I'm writing down stuff to research later. Um, oh, here is our last question before we wrap things up. This one's from Jared again. Uh, would it be reasonable to look at other better studied sites from the early Jurassic? And could we potentially use some of our knowledge from these sites to try and predict or estimate the missing pieces we don't have yet from Antarctica? Like what families or subfamilies of theropod may have likely occupied these niches? Yeah, that's... That's a really great point, and that's absolutely true. And that's one of the ways that we kind of start some of our hypotheses, especially those about biogeography. 
um, for looking for stuff in Antarctica is we can kind of look at the patterns of, okay, we, we see, so for where we worked in the Shackleton Glacier, a lot of the animals that we find in Antarctica have either the same species or close relatives in South Africa, right? And so some of the hypotheses we're testing there are, okay, are the animals that we're finding in Antarctica truly just kind of a subset of what is in other parts of the world at the same time, or are there some distinct things? Are there some endemic species that are only in Antarctica and not in these other places? Um, and kind of the flip side of your question, too, is that when we do things like exhibit design or reconstructions of these animals, we, we, we fill in those pieces. We don't just kind of make up the rest of the dinosaur if we don't have, you know, 50% of it or its arm or its tail or something like that. We, we use evolutionary inference. We use those family trees of dinosaurs and say, okay, if this dinosaur, you know, we've only got 50% of it, we need to fill in what the arm looked like. Well, what's its closest relative? What does that, the arm look like that, in that species? Um, and we do this all the time, sometimes without even thinking about it in, in paleontology exhibits. I often tell people, you know, using, using family trees and, and evolutionary inferences um, is something that uh, is more common to you than you think. If you think about picture in your head what... Uh, a saber-toothed cat from the tar pits looks like, right? It's it's going to be covered in fur, but we've never pulled out a fossil with fur from the Blaine tar pits, right? We're making that inference that it had fur because we know what that animal is related to. We know it's a cat. Yeah, and little plug, last month we had our Making Monsters Discovery Day online where we talked about how artists and scientists work together to reconstruct the past and also create fictional creatures. So I would highly recommend, if you're interested in learning more about those, check out last month's videos on our YouTube channel. Um, well, that does it for uh, today. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for joining us today. That was a, a wonderful presentation, really cool stories, and I, it's, I hope it sparked a lot of people's interest in learning about Antarctic dinos. Um, if folks want to learn more about your work or more about uh, the Antarctic dinos in general, where's the best place for them to go check out? So we still have um, uh, on our exhibit webpage, I think, some information about Antarctic dinosaurs. Uh, the Field Museum has a page dedicated to them as well. If you even navigate on there, they have an interactive webpage, I think, that's um, expeditions at the Field Museum. That um, This was before the exhibit and film and our last trip that we, we kind of did a special webpage leading up to our 2010 expedition. And so you can find some fun interactives and maps some pictures on that as well great i'll be sure to put those in the description below um so bef as we close out one last thing to i ask folks is uh what's the what's the one piece of advice you would give to future paleontologists or maybe someone who would like to work on antarctic dinosaurs in the future oh yeah so one piece of advice that i love giving to um, to future paleontologists is that, you know, there is a place for you in paleontology no matter what you're interested in. The, the best part about paleontology is that it's an integrative um, and interdisciplinary science, right? So if you are the kid that loves being outdoors and playing in the dirt, you know, we've got a place for you. If you are the kid that loves being indoors and working on a computer, we've got a place for you in paleontology. If you're interested in the animals and their anatomy, Right? If you're interested in more in the rocks and the paleo environments, if you're interested more in the geochemistry, if you're interested in crunching big data or working with 3D models and visualizations, like all of those things come together at, at the nexus of paleontology. And so, you know, you can bring your interest to this science and be a part of it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that, Dr. Smith. And thank you, everybody else, for joining us today on Discovery Day Online, The Mighty Dinosaurs. Uh, we really appreciate everyone tuning in, asking so many good questions. And of course, thank you, Dr. Smith, for spending your time with us to share these really awesome stories. Um, if you like this program and want to support programs like it at the ALF Museum, you can find links on how to do that in the description below. And as always, make sure you like and subscribe to our channel for more stories from the world of paleontology. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you on the next Discovery Day.